Hey everyone, this is Ryan here and welcome back to our periodontic series. This video is going to be about surgical therapy in periodontics. So I apologize in advance, this is going to be a really long video, but it's a really interesting topic, so I hope we can have a lot of fun learning about it. So local therapy is designed to remove bacterial plaque and local factors that favor its accumulation. Now, we already talked about non-surgical therapy, and when that's not enough to resolve the disease, often surgical therapy is then considered. Since we're talking about surgical therapy, we need to talk about gingival flap design. So gingival flaps are used for better access and visibility to the area of concern. So I'm gonna go through each of these concepts, and they're all important to know for the board exam, and I'll go through them one at a time so we can really um, understand the concept behind them. So the first one is that the base of the flap should be wider than the top of the flap to ensure adequate blood supply. So in this first image here, that idea is illustrated. You can see the top of the flap is up here, and since it was flapped up, this area was uh, by the teeth. You can tell that the, the scalloping matches where the gingival margins were, and the base of the flap is still in contact with the bone. So you can notice the base of the flap is wider than the top, and this ensures that the minimal amount of vasculature is severed, and the top of the flap can remain well vascularized and vital after surgery. Here's an example where the base is narrower than the top, and that's not good because we're severing some vasculature here and here that could supply the, the top corners and you can get tissue necrosis, just not a good result. The next concept is that incisions should occur over intact bone, not over bony defects or eminences. So you wanna avoid vertical incisions over bony prominences, like by the canines, the piriform ridge, lingual of the mandible, and you also wanna avoid areas of bony defects. So we can see the second image illustrating that idea. These incisions are on a nice, sound, intact bone. You can notice this area of recession, a big bony defect here. And this is not a good flap because the vertical incision is right by that defect. Say, for example, we, were, we had to surgically extract that tooth. You certainly want the flap margin to be at least one or, teeth, one or two teeth over from um, the area you're working on. You want the corners of the flap to be rounded, not sharp. Vertical releases, these vertical incisions, should occur at the line angles of their respective teeth. So that's where the third image comes in. Um, you can, and you can also appreciate this in the previous two, but the ideal area for the margin of the flap to contact the tooth is going to be right at the line angle. That's because if you did it in the middle of the papilla, you'd cause loss of that papilla, and you'd have the formation of what are known as black triangles. If the, the uh, edge of the flap came into the mid-facial surface of the tooth, then that often would cause noticeable gingival recession. So you don't want to be mid-facial, you don't want to be mid-papilla, you want to be in between the two, and right at the line angle. So line one here illustrates being mid papilla, line two here illustrates being mid facial. And you also wanna avoid vital structures. Uh, you should be careful high up in the labial maxilla, in the infraorbital region, and in the lingual mandible, where you have thin tissue, uh, where the labial, uh, where the lingual artery, excuse me, is. So you wanna avoid uh, vital structures like that. And like I've talked about in previous videos, it's really important uh, what the patient is doing at home to take care of their teeth, just as important as what you're doing um, in the clinic, if not more important. So like that, post-operative plaque control is the most important procedure after periodontal surgery. So the next thing we have to talk about for flaps, we talked about flap design. Now let's talk about the two different types in terms of thickness. So we have the split or partial thickness flap or mucosal flap. I included all the names here just to be thorough. 
and the full thickness or mucoperiosteal flap. So this name is helpful to include because it clues you in to the actual layers that are included in the flap. So for the mucosal one, we have the gingiva or the mucosa and the submucosa. So whether you're uh, gingiva or mucosa depends on where you are relative to the mucogingival junction. So both of these include the epithelium and the lamina propria, and the submucosa has the vessels and the underlying nerves, uh, things like that. So this type of flap is a little less aggressive, and it's used for mucogingival surgery because we don't need to expose the bone. That would be unnecessary. The full thickness flap is called mucoperiosteal because it includes the periosteum. So the periosteum is that thin, really dense connective tissue layer that uh, directly contacts and covers bone. So we have to remove that and include that as part of the flap when we need to contact, when we need to work on the actual bone. So that's used for osteosurgery and periodontal regeneration to permit primary closure as well as an apically repositioned flaps. We'll talk about all that later on in the video, um, but I will say primary closure, when I say that, I'm talking about the edges of the soft tissue when sutured back together touch each other. In other words, there's no open wound left. That would be secondary closure. So whenever alveolar bone is exposed, like in the full thickness flaps, expect about one millimeter of bone resorption and remodeling. That's sort of a natural body response and you should expect some amount of resorption anytime bone is exposed to the oral cavity. So we talked about flap design and now we talked about the two different types, uh, partial thickness and full thickness flaps. Papilla preservation is a concept that I've sort of already talked about uh, we talked about how we don't want to split the papilla. That was sort of the conventional flap design was have the margins go straight through the papilla. But then we were getting this uh, papilla loss and formation of black triangles. So the papilla preservation flap is to preserve the papilla. So now this is sort of different from what we were talking about here. These are wider flaps to expose a large area of bone. Th these are smaller incisions if we just wanted to work on a smaller localized area. And you, But you can see the concept is the same. The edges of the flap contact the line angles of the teeth. So the three types of papilla preservation flaps are detailed in these three lines. This one goes uh, from the lingual line angle of this tooth to the facial line angle of this tooth. This one scalloped from lingual line angle to lingual line angle. This one scalloped from facial line angle to facial line angle. So those are papilla preservation flaps. So let's talk a little bit more about the full thickness flap. Since we're involving the periosteum layer, there are some specific uh, incisions that we need to know when doing this type of flap. So the first one is the internal or reverse bevel incision. And that's uh, shown as one in this image. And it's about one millimeter from the gingival margin, the crest of the gingiva. So you can see it's a little bit apart from that. It's beveled, it's not straight up and down, straight side to side. And it's used to remove the pocket lining, yet conserve the outer gingiva. The sulcular or curvicular incision, shown as number two here, is right through the base of the pocket to the alveolar crest. So you can imagine like sticking a periodontal probe into a pocket. Instead, now we're taking a scalpel and cutting through the pocket to the, to the uh, bone. And number three here is the interdental or interproximal incision. And that's to remove the collar of tissue around the tooth you created with the first two incisions. So you can see number one contacts this area of bone, number two contacts this area of bone, and so there's this little piece of soft tissue that's still connected to bone that we're just gonna slice off with that last third incision. So the combination of all three of those incisions is what we could call a modified Widman flap. It involves those three incisions and provides access to subgingival areas for debridement, 
for cleaning, if there was calculus there for say, we, we couldn't get with the uh, conventional scaling and replaning and with the goal of new attachment. Now we also have an apically repositioned flap, which requires the addition of vertical releasing incisions. Note that all three of these were horizontal and involved the top of the flap here. And now we're adding in these two vertical slices so that we can, um, and you want to make sure they're beyond the mucogingival junction. And so then you can um, safely, um, you can safely get underneath the, the gingiva and the mucosa here, flap this area up, and you can um, position the flap so that the, the top of the flap doesn't come up to where it was here. It actually, it, you position it so it's a little bit apical to where it was originally. And that's in order to attain pocket reduction by moving, physically moving the gingival margin apically. So the periodontal pack is a uh, device that's sometimes used after this sort of invasive flap surgery, usually consists of ZOE, which is zinc oxide eugenol. And you might recognize this if you watched uh, my endodontics videos, it's also the main ingredient in gutta percha and endodontic sealer. You leave it in place typically for one week and they're placed to protect the surgical wound, minimize discomfort, maintain tissue placement, and help prevent post-op bleeding. The important thing to know for the board exam is that packs do not enhance healing. They, you can think of the zinc ox oxide eugenol as having sort of a soothing quality. So it doesn't enhance healing, but it does protect um, these things. So you'd think it would enhance healing, but it actually doesn't. So that's an important distinction to know for the board exam. A little bit counterintuitive. All right, so the first category of surgery is gingival surgery. So this is surgery only involving the gingiva only soft tissue above the mucogingival junction. There are two types of gingival surgery. There's gingivectomy, which is excision of gingiva to eliminate super bony pockets or gingival enlargements, say drug-induced gingival enlargement from a calcium channel blocker. Gingivoplasty is excision of gingiva, sounds similar, to reshape tissue deformities. So you might be thinking, what the heck is the difference between the two of those? They sound awfully similar. Well, the difference between the two is the treatment objective. So the ectomy is more aggressive, and again, it's to eliminate pockets or enlargements. And the plasty is just some aesthetic reshaping. It's more for the aesthetics, uh, less aggressive recontouring. So it's the way that it's... Um, used and the objective that you're trying to achieve is where you would distinguish between the two terms. That's how I think of it anyway. Healing by this type of surgery is by secondary intention only because there is no tissue to approximate. So I mentioned primary closure before. Uh, closure and intention, same thing. Primary closure, where the wound edges are uh, approximated, they touch each other. The secondary closure or intention is where they do not, so you have an open wound. And this makes sense because if you're just cutting gingiva off, there's nothing you can reattach, suture together. Um, you're going to have some amount of uh, open wound there. Um, a specific type of gingival surgery is distal wedge surgery. This is for pocket reduction distal to terminal molars. Depending if you're in the upper arch or lower arch, this looks different. So for the maxillary terminal molar, you have you do a full thickness flap, so you're including periosteum in that, with parallel incisions. So the two incisions here are parallel to each other. For mandibular, again, full thickness flap, including periosteum, with a V-shaped incisions. So you can see that in this. So I, I love these two images because they clearly denote um, the two different types of incisions used and Believe it or not, this is um, definitely important to know for the board exam. It's a little bit of a niche surgery, but uh, certainly important to know. All right, the second category of surgery that we're going to talk about is mucogingival surgery. So now we're including both the gingiva 
and the mucosa, all the soft tissue above and below the mucogingival junction. So uh, I don't know if I can, if I can over overemphasize how important this is to know. Knowing the free gingival graft and the connective tissue graft is is going to get you uh, so many questions, and it's so great, just so great to know it. It really cleared everything up for uh, for my head when I was in dental school. So um, the free gingival graft is well. Let me just say th these are the two main types of soft tissue grafts, uh, and definitely again commit this to memory. And I hope I can explain it to you so you really understand the concepts here. So keratinized tissue, as we talked about in the very first video in this series, includes both the free gingiva and the attached gingiva. And of these two, the attached gingiva is the most ideal tissue type, but both of these are preferable to the non-keratinized alveolar mucosa. Um, and that's because um, this uh, keratin layer is a lot stronger. You know, the whole purpose of this graft, the free gingival graft, is that we really want keratinized tissue to surround not only natural teeth, but also crowns and implants because it's stronger, it's tougher, and less easy to irritate on tooth brushing because of the keratin layer. So uh, in this example here, we have a lot of soft tissue recession around an implant here, and you can see this darker mucosa the lighter areas are uh, keratinized. That's because the, the keratin um, makes it look whiter. And this area, we have mucosa right up against the implant. And so that's going to get uh, really irritated if the patient's trying to brush there. It's not as resistant to the irritation as the kerat keratinized layer is. So the free gingival graft is to widen the band of keratinized tissue. So what we would do, if I can get the pen out, is we would want to perform a free gingival graft in this area here. And that could be a valid treatment option for the patient to uh, promote the growth of keratinized tissue there uh, where there's only alveolar mucosa there now. In contrast, the connective tissue graft involves taking a layer of connective tissue, usually from the palate and uh, sutured over an exposed root surface. So um, like, let's say this tooth right here has a lot of recession and we could place a connective tissue graft over this area of exposed root in order to promote uh, the coverage of that root. So say that patient was really sensitive in that area where there is exposed dentin and the connective tissue graft could be a great treatment option for that patient. So what you do again is take this connective tissue from the palate, you'd suture it over the exposed root surface, usually create a coronally advanced flap to move the already existing, uh, the ideal keratinized tissue layer up and over this new graft. And so this type of graft is to cover the exposed root surface. So there's a big difference between the two. They may seem, they may seem slightly similar, and they are, but in a very simplified but helpful way of differentiating the two, the free gingival graft happens below or apical to the gingival margin, and the connective tissue graft happens above or coronal to the gingival margin. So one is to widen the band of keratinized tissue, and the other one is for root coverage. So knowing and distinguishing between these two grafts is super, super important and will, I promise, will really, really help. Um, the last three things to mention here for mucogingival surgery, we can do a phrenectomy, which is a complete removal of the frenum. Phrenotomy is uh, just an incision of the frenum, not a complete removal. So again, we see the ectomy being the more aggressive form of surgery, and we'll see that again in the future. And vestibuloplasty is where you make an incision um, in the base of the vestibule in order to deepen it. All right, and this is sort of a review of what we just talked about uh, if you want to go over it in writing. So this includes some measurements, and if you're interested why it's called a free gingival graft, uh, free by definition 
uh, the free, a free graft by definition is transplanted without a nourishing blood supply. So it must undergo revascularization from the recipient bed that's receiving that graft. So uh, the free gingival graft is only the epithelium layer. It lacks a blood supply. So when you perform a split thickness flap, you expose the vascular bed at the recipient site so that it can feed and nourish the new uh, keratinized tissue. And connective tissue graft, uh, same sort of thing. This is just a review about what we talked about. And I briefly mentioned this, but the palate is the most common donor site for both of these, for both the free gingival graft and the connective tissue graft. So definitely remember that the palate is the most often used site for this sort of surgery. All right, so the third category of surgery is osseous surgery. So now we're no longer talking about soft tissue, now we're talking about the bone. And just like anything, before we do any treatment, we want to observe and analyze what's there to start with. So let's talk about bone architecture and what this concept refers to. So visual, visual, visualization of bony architecture allows the clinician to determine the types of bony defects that are present and the extent of those defects. Positive architecture means that the interproximal bone is coronal to radicular bone. And that's what we see in image A. So the interproximal bone that is between the teeth is higher than the radicular bone, which is around the root. And that's, that's pretty normal. Flat architecture is where interproximal and radicular bone are at the same height. It's flat across. Negative architecture is where the interproximal bone is apical to the radicular bone. And that's the opposite of what is normal, healthy bone architecture. So positive architecture is what we want. So for osteosurgery, we have two different types of surgery. We have the ostectomy, which is removal of supporting bone, and osteotomy, which is removal of non-supporting bone. So remember, gingivectomy was excision of tissue, and gingivoplasty was this more conservative reshaping and recontouring. So again, the ectomy is the more aggressive type. Same situation here. Ostectomy is, again, removal of supporting alveolar bone, meaning it's directly supporting the tooth. It's in direct contact with the periodontal ligament. Osteotomy, in contrast, is reduction of bone away from the tooth. They both aim to create a more physiologic, positive bony architecture, but one does with removal of supporting bone and one does not. So that's the main distinction between those two. Uh, after ostectomy, there's often these peaks of bone remaining at the line angles called widow's peaks, which predispose to periodontal pockets in these areas, basically saying to do a thorough job, sm smooth everything, round everything out, so you don't have these sharp areas of bone left over, but sometimes you can't help it and have to go back and do uh, an osteotomy to reshape and recontour that area. So I also want to briefly tie in an important concept called clinical crown lengthening. This is where you want to expose more tooth structure by lowering the bone for several different purposes, one of which is gaining more ferrule for crown support, which I have a separate video on the ferrule effect and biologic width, so check that out if you want to learn more about those concepts. But clinical crown lengthening is essentially combining osseous resection or the ostectomy, lowering the bone with either a gingivectomy by uh, cutting the a collar of gingiva away if there and that would, you would do that if there would be at least uh, two millimeters of keratinized tissue remaining after the gingivectomy or otherwise you'd have to do an apically positioned flap like i talked about before physically moving the gingival margin down and that would be to conserve the keratinized tissue that is there so osteosurgery is used in a whole bunch of areas in dentistry uh, and periodontics and um, in prosthodontics to get more feral effect. So you can see how removing some bone, lowering the bone area, 
will also effectively um, lower where the gingiva is if you combine it with a gingivectomy or apically positioned flap. So mechani mechanisms of healing after surgery, uh, there are a couple of different ways that the situation can go. You can have regeneration, which is a complete restoration of architecture and function, or repair, which is not completely restoring architecture and function. It involves healing by scar or formation of long junctional epithelium. So we talked about junctional epithelium. It has a weak hemidesmosomal attachment to enamel, but it is a sign of healing towards a shallower pocket. This term, long junctional epithelium, is used when a pocket was once very deep, and since the bone and periodontal ligament have been irreversibly damaged and gone um, this uh, had this physically long um, this physically long pocket that was formed, the soft tissue that comes into its place is a very physically long, several millimeters long worth of junctional epithelium that attaches to the tooth, and that's the best we can hope for natural healing. And so these two terms are form a dichotomy, and these two forms, uh, these two form a dichotomy as well. So reattachment is the reunion of epithelial and connective tissue with the, the tooth root surface after incision or injury, whereas new attachment is embedding of fresh new PDL fibers into new cementum that has been previously deprived of its original attachment. So you may be wondering, well, Ryan, you just talked about how bone and PDL um, were irreversibly damaged and the best we can hope for is this long junctional epithelium attaching to the tooth, but how do we get new attachment with new PDL? Well, wonder no longer. The last category of surgery is regenerative surgery. And this is where we seek to actually regenerate tissue that was lost. So periodontal regeneration, also uh, formally known as guided tissue regeneration, where we want to regenerate bone, cementum, and PDL. Yes, we're going to try to reverse and regenerate bone and PDL and cementum that was lost by the periodontal disease. Now, this can't be done in every situation. There's very uh, specific situations and um, really good patient motivation and oral hygiene to make this stuff happen, but it is possible in select situations. So in this treatment, there are three Bs that are frequently used by operators to have the best chance for successful tissue regeneration. So I'm a big fan of video games, and there are three classic roles that a group of players working together would assume to take on a big boss. So I'm gonna uh, div diverge for a second here and talk about um, these three roles, and I think they'll, they'll help uh, you remember these three Bs. So the tank takes the damage from the boss and protects the rest of the players. The damage focus on dealing damage and defeating the boss, and the healer, uh, or the healers are responsible for making sure the other players stay alive. So I remember the three materials of the regeneration process by assigning each one of these roles to each one of these materials. So the barrier membrane is like the tank. It's placed over the defect, and its job is to protect the area. The bone graft is the damage because it's doing the bulk of the work. It gets right in there and it's used to regenerate the missing bone. And the biologic agent is like the healer because it's a medicament that creates a supportive environment for the rest of the components to do their job. So I remember the tank, the damage, and the healer as the three Bs barrier membrane, bone graft, and biologic agent. It's a little bit silly, but I think it really helps, at least really helps me remember what each of those things are doing, and let alone what they are. So, why do we need these three components for regeneration? Well, if we did nothing, this is what wound healing would look like. And these cells populate a wound area during the healing process listed from fastest to slowest. So, the epithelial cells uh, 
and the connective tissue cells would repopulate that wound area fastest, and the PDL cells labeled four, the bone cells labeled three, are the two slowest. So this should make sense because, like I was talking about before, the natural healing process would result in a long junctional epithelium, and you'd get all this soft tissue would grow down into this wound, and we, the bone and PDL wouldn't get a chance to grow up and restore that attachment that was once there. So if we do nothing, let the wound heal, often get a long junctional epithelium, which is a sign of healing, yes, but it's not a complete regeneration. That would just be a repair. So we really want to get a full regeneration when we're talking about periodontal regeneration or guided tissue regeneration. So that's why uh, we use those three components. The barrier membrane would slip in here and that would prevent the downgrowth of the soft tissue components and we'd place the graft in here to provide a physical, um, physical scaffolding to promote new bone formation and we'd also use the biologic agent to help support everything. So the tank, damage, and the heal. You can also do direct root surface treatment with chelating agents like EDTA and citric acid, can expose collagen fibrils through demineralization, and may improve the uh, success of new attachment. All right, so bone graft materials have a lot of definitions associated with them. So I made them as simple as possible so we can remember them for the board exam. So the best, um, well, let's talk about uh, these definitions first, and then I can go a little bit more in depth. So we have four different types of bone graft materials. There's autograft, which means the bone comes from yourself. Allograft is from another human, usually a cadaver. The xenograft is from another animal, usually a cow. And the alloplast is a synthetic or inorganic. You can think of like plastic being a synthetic, uh, synthetic material, just like alloplast is a synthetic material. So those are the four main categories of graft materials. And there are three um, main ideas that grafts can carry out. So osteoconductive means that the graft, the graft is forming a physical scaffold to hold that area open and provide area for a bone to fill in. Osteoinductive means it's, it's converting neighboring progenitor cells, bone, these kind of young bone cells that are nearby into osteoblasts that are going to in turn form bone. Osteogenic means that the bone graft material itself is actually forming new bone. So the um, autograft is the best grafting material because it has all three of these qualities. The autograft is conductive, inductive, and genic. The allograft is the next best one. It has the osteoconductive and inductive qualities, but not the genic. And all of the bone grafts um, are osteoconductive. So the xenograft and alloplast are osteoconductive, but not the other two. So listed from first to fourth is sort of the, the order from best to worst bone graft materials. So a summary of everything we've talked about. Um, I know it's a lot. We've talked about the four categories of periodontal surgery, the, the gingival, mucogingival, osseous, and regenerative. And they kind of fit into these two overarching categories of additive, where we're trying to restore tissue. You can do that with regeneration, uh, free gingival graft, connective tissue graft, and advancing the flap coronally. Or we can talk about a subtractive method where we're trying to bring uh, levels down and reduce pocket depths by doing uh, osseous surgery, recontouring to get that positive bony architecture, gingivectomy, or apically positioned flap to physically move the gingival margin down and reduce pocket depths.
And tying it all together, I'm going to leave you with this slide full of beautiful things to know for the board exam. These make for really good board exam questions because it ties in the diagnosis classification stuff we talked about from earlier in the series with the available treatment options covered in this video. So for, and this is maybe a bit of an overgeneralization, but definitely a great tool for the board exam. So one and two wall defects, you typically would opt to do osseous resection. So doing ostectomy to recontour the bone to restore that ideal natural positive architecture. Whereas if you have three and four wall defects, you would opt to try regener regeneration. And that's because the more walls you have, the better blood supply and cell source proximity you have. So the deep, narrow, three wall defect is the ideal, theoretical ideal for regenerating infrabony defects. So a deep, narrow, three wall defect has the most surface area possible of available bone to populate the graft with bone cells and also to protect the graft while everything is uh, regenerating. So think about if you were in a big uh, hurricane, would you rather be in a house with four walls or a house with one wall? And so the more, the more walls you have, the more protected the graft is, and the more walls there are to provide new natural bone cells to, to form new bone in that area. The same concept with frications. So a HAMP class two frication in either the a buckle of, the, of an upper molar or either buccal or lingual of lower molars is ideal for regener regenerating frication defects. Again, the class two provides the deepest, narrowest defect with the most available bony walls. And the Miller class one with a thick gingival biotype, really nice thick gums, and a wide band of keratinized tissue at least two millimeters wide is ideal for regenerating recession defects. It's a near, and we talked about this in the first video, but it's a near 100% chance of success of root coverage with a connective tissue graft with this type of soft tissue defect. So to remember, the best types of uh, the ideal defects to restore with their respective treatments I remember three for three wall, two for ham class two, and one for Miller class one. So tying it all together is as easy as three, two, and one. All right, guys, I know that was a lot of material in this video. Um, just go ahead and, and watch it a few times and feel free to ask me questions in the comments if anything wasn't clear. I, I really hope you enjoyed the video and thanks so much for watching everyone and thanks for all the support. I'll see you all in the next video of the periodontic series.